Testing for MRD uh, has uh, now come to the forefront and is being increasingly used in a number of settings. I would say at this point primarily in academic centers or in centers that practice uh, um, stem cell transplantation. We have a number of referral centers where some of our uh, uh, community colleagues would refer their patients to. Uh, we are doing this as, as the standard of care. So uh, for my patients where we complete um, autologous stem cell transplantation at what's called a day 100 visit, we're doing testing for MRD status. Now we do that um, uh, both through flow cytometry as well as next generation sequencing uh, to try to determine to a level of 10 to the minus six whether there's any evidence of residual cells or, or not. Now MRD is defining in my mind the two parameters that are most important for the long-term outcome of myeloma patients. So number one is if you may on a vertical axis that would be on the y-axis the depth of the response. So we're trying to get patients into that MRD negative status. And I think as we go over time and we think about strategies for maintenance, we're going to start using more MRD testing to determine who needs to continue on therapy versus not. And that's the other use we have for that now is that if we see a patient who has a durable complete remission and that maybe has been on maintenance for two years or three years and that complete remission remains, we actually do MRD testing at that point. Uh, not as a sole deciding factor, but bringing it as a piece of information that we would use in the conversation with patients at that point, whether we should continue with maintenance therapy or not. There's many reasons why you would continue. You could make an argument for that based on some of the clinical trials, but also there's reasons why a person may want to discontinue therapy. And like every other test that we do, any laboratory test that we do, it just adds information that are used uh, at the bedside or you know, in our clinical encounters to decide whether we will continue with therapy or not. So for us, we're using it as routine. I personally believe that a threshold of 10 to the minus six, however that is um, determined, is really where we should go, not 10 to the minus five. And there's approaches that are being explored through even novel technologies, including uh, some proteomic assays. Uh, but I, I think really it's here to stay. Uh, some recent clinical trial data shows that MRD is really uh, the goal and it should be all that we should aspire to. Now there's exceptions to this and I won't go into all of that, but there's some patients that can keep a small monoclonal protein and do very well. But at the time you start therapy, I think the aspiration should be for patients to get into MRD status. In fact, um, I would refer uh, the, the listeners that we have, uh, I have a video where I did a one hour interview with the Vice President for Medical Affairs for Adaptive, where we go into some of those details of how we can use MRD testing in the clinic. MRD testing is obviously a, a new diagnostic and monitoring tool now, which I think is extremely relevant specifically in how we are using drugs right now, given that we're already talking about three and four drug combinations, uh, and given that we are seeing complete responses of anywhere between 40 and 50%, and if you're then trying to compare these different quadruplets or triplets, I think using a tool such as MRD testing or looking for molecular remissions is the way forward. So that is the future. Now, how does one define MRD testing as of right now? Uh, what we in the scientific community will accept is MRD testing to the uh, tune of 10 to the times minus six. That's how sensitive your test should be. So one in a million cells. Now, whether or not you use a genotypic-based MRD testing strategy or use a flow-based strategy, it doesn't really matter, and it should be dependent on what's available at that specific site. Um, I think the bottom line is the sensitivity, and I'm saying sensitivity of 10 times minus 6 right now, who knows, a year down the line, we might say we want it even more sensitive. We just don't have the tools just as yet. And whether or not you use a flow-based assay or you use a genotypic-based assay really depends on the availability of what is available to you at your site. The bone marrow microenvironment is extremely important in multiple myeloma. We and others have been studying that for many decades, honestly. And in the uh, microenvironment in patients with myeloma, the fact that myeloma cells bind to the microenvironment, extracellular matrix proteins, or accessory cells in the bone marrow 
in and of itself confers drug resistance. We also have in the bone marrow cytokines, TGF-beta, interleukin-10, um, many others, VEGF, that can confer immunosuppression. And finally, we have cells that are constitutively present, like T regulatory cells, or myeloid derived suppressor cells, or plasmacytoid dendritic cells. These are cells in the marrow of patients with myeloma that not only help to promote tumor growth, but they are immunosuppressive. The really, uh, as in solid tumors, the really important concept is that when myeloma cells actually move into the bone marrow microenvironment where they grow in patients, they actually induce T regulatory cells. They induce myeloid-derived suppressor cells and other mechanisms of immunosuppression. So getting rid of myeloma is really important in achieving MRD negativity, but so is trying to correct this abnormal bone marrow microenvironment, which on the one hand promotes growth and drug resistance of the cancer, but also promotes immunosuppression.